Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of No Such Things of Fish, where we are joined by the wonderful Ella Al-Shamahi. Uh, you might remember Ella from episode 373 of No Such Things of Fish, uh, when she last appeared. Uh, but if you don't remember that, then she is a paleoanthropologist, she's an expert in Neanderthals, she is a National Geographic explorer, she's just an all-round badass. Ella has written a book called The Handshake, A Gripping History, which we talked about last time she was on. Uh, But she's also been on loads of TV shows, loads of documentaries. Uh, The last one, I think, was called Our Changing Planet, all about the world's most threatened ecosystems. And you can actually still watch that if you go to BBC iPlayer uh, or PBS Video app. Anyway, really hope you enjoy this week's show. Don't forget Club Fish exists, the place where you can get loads of extra content and ad-free episodes. Don't forget there are still one or two tickets, I think, possibly left for our live shows coming up in the Soho Theatre in London. And you can get those by going to nosuchthingsafish.com forward slash Soho. Anyway, that's enough of that. Really hope you enjoy this week's show with Ella and it's on with the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hoburn. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with Andrew Hunter-Murray, James Harkin and Ella Al-Shamahi. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is Ella. American beer was so bad in the early 1900s that the US government sent Alexander Graham Bell's son-in-law on a secret mission to Bavaria to steal German hops. Wow. (laughs) Gosh, so much to unpick. Yeah. Okay, so Alexander Graham Bell's son-in-law, was that an important part of, was that what the American government were looking for? Was that the brief? The really sad thing is, David Fairchild (laughs) is like a hugely celebrated botanist and is described as the food explorer. And yet for our purposes, he's just Alexander Graham Bell's (laughs) son-in-law. Because to be fair, if he was your father-in-law, that's the end of your identity, right? But was it, maybe this was at the point when there was only two telephones in the country. (laughs) And so the government would just call him up and say, you got anyone we could use? Yeah. Yeah. So you think when he, invented two telephones alexander graham bell he gave one to the government and kept one himself yeah <laughs> no one else needs one it's fine and it became like the bat phone it was yeah. any time they were needed for anything bell phone yeah, yeah the bell I'm phone. loving the facts today guys <laughs> <laughs> so yeah what what's this guy fairchild so all right so david fairchild so he's a food explorer um and i think he's absolutely fascinating because explorers usually go around the planet let's be honest discovering stuff but also pillaging a lot and what have you and like stealing artifacts and whatever takes your fancy um um, but this guy did it with plants, with botany, um, which good. is, in my mind, is just like the loveliest thing to go around the planet stealing. Because <laughs> <laughs> all he's doing is he's basically turned around at the beginning of the 1900s going and the end of the 1800s going. America is a country clearly on the rise, mm. but our agriculture is bad. Our food is bad. Like our industries as mm. related to, as you know, as they relate to plants are just bad. So I'm going to go off to 50 odd countries and just collect samples, send seeds back, send saplings back, that kind of thing. And because it's plants, I just can't get mad at him because yeah. I'm just like, you were yeah. just helping to feed your people and build industry. Could we get him canceled because he was like stealing from the farmers? Well, are, in you other tr- are you trying to get him canceled? I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> I do this on this podcast. Yeah. Whoever we have on, I try Don't ever mention them. anyone you like on this show. James will find a way gonna... to destroy. Do not do, not do this to me because okay. I actually, I've <laughs> decided that he is, he's like the one explorer that I really have nothing bad to say about. I'm okay. like, oh, oh, fair enough. You're trying to feed your people. Yeah. Oh, he did give the American broccoli and kale so oh yeah yeah i love those two things it's interesting how limited american food was i didn't really appreciate that before the 1890s when he really Mm. got cracking they'd had a they had occasional introductions like in the world's fair in 1876 which was effectively america's 100th birthday they got the banana that was right. good. That yeah. was a big advance. Also, can we you know? just take a second to talk about world fairs? Oh, like, yeah, aren't they can. just the best thing ever? Oh, yeah. yeah. Just, just this world where you were like, oh, let's just do a world fair. 
And it actually was legit. Like everyone was like, oh crap, that's actually, that's new. That's what is that? It's yellow and it's bendy. That's amazing. When yeah. did we last have one? It's, well, it's I went to one time. in um, Dubai <laughs> this year. Oh, oh okay. yes. Okay, so, um, so this year. Oh yeah, they did. Yeah, they, they had did, one. Well, they did one during COVID. Uh, and obviously no one could go. <laughs> and then uh, when I went, everything was closed. So you couldn't even get an Uber. Everyone had gone home. Oh, it's like, right. that's what, cause that's what it is. They build them these sort of huge things, don't they? And all the different countries have their different stalls where yep. they're saying in Uzbekistan, mm. we make amazing bananas or whatever. And then two years later, they all go home and that's it. They only do it with countries that are on the rise, right? Right. Yeah, like I like I we know. wouldn't do a world. America wouldn't do a world fair anymore. We are the world. Like, yes. Why would we do a world fair? There was, a, there was the big one in America. Carl Sagan went to as a kid, so Sagan would be in his eighties if he was still alive, or ninety. So you know, oh, okay. Within uh, that. the one in Dubai, just to say this, yeah, yeah. is quite interesting because each country made their own sort of building. And they were all kind of shaped with Uzbekistani design or Azerbaijani design or whatever. Mm. And now they're changing it and they're turning it into flats, the whole place. Oh, wow. And they're okay. going to make it so you can live in this area. But it means that all these buildings are just these incredible designs that are made from the best architects in the world. It sounds but... like you're selling Dubai instead of cancelling Dubai, which I thought I thought, <laughs> I thought you were the cancelling of Dubai. Uh, what? Visit Dubai. There's no, you can't get an Uber there. You can't, there's no shops there or anything. Yeah, so I wouldn't want to live there. Oh, yeah. oh that's Famous the bad like, side of Dubai. Guys, that, 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 of all the bad crap that Famously, you there are no shops in Dubai. <laughs> um, someone emailed in, and I'm going to butcher their fact now, and also not credit them, but because I didn't think we we're going to end up talking about world fairs. It was a few years ago. The Brazilian delegation turned their entire thing into a trampoline. What? It was something like a four thousand square foot trampoline. The wow. Brazilian. That like, can't be bit said. Of Is, the world. Was it to sell rubber? I don't think it was. What? I don't even think it was. I think it was just saying, look. Everyone else has got good stuff here. We've got a big old trampoline. So just come along, have a bounce, enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> they had a I big project that at the last minute got taken away. Right, they what went, have we got? What have we got? <laughs> Why are we talking about the World Fair? I'm sorry, I got distracted. Yeah, this is what happens when Ella <laughs> is around. <laughs> because during the World Fair, the banana was introduced to America. <laughs> uh, and okay. it's not food introduction. And by Fairchild or someone else? This is by pre, someone else. This is just, that was like a sporadic thing. But yeah. then when he really got going, yeah. he was privately funded as well. Yes. yes. By Barbour Lathrop. Yes, yes, yes. A wonderfully oh, no. gay, fabulous figure, basically, who's just this incredible philanthropist. Squillionaire, just looking for something to fund. And, and they yeah. bumped into each other on a boat, didn't they? And he yeah. just went, I'll fund this trip yeah. with you trying to steal avocados. <laughs> yeah, why not? It's, this sounds great. Can I just say, as, a, as, a, as an explorer with National Geographic, that is our dream. That we like, No, no, no. If you think I'm kidding, you do not know like my friend group in the sense that we are like, we literally just sit there constantly going, right, how do we get this kind of thing from philanthropy and every so often it works out so like i've got friends that like mm -hmm. they're like this smart friend of the philanthropist who is like some billionaire or millionaire yeah. they're like their sugar mama dada yeah. whatever have i, have I yeah. ever told you the the story of uh, nat geo <laughs> somebody walks up to me it's really old guy bless him first time i've ever been at national geographic and he looks at me and goes uh i'm from austin texas i'm not an oil man but i've got money and i want to give you some what? <laughs> what? Oh. what the hell I saw that money in my account. An expedition was part funded by it. Wow. So, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so as simple as that. Okay, so it does happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's amazing. <sighs> so Fairchild, I agree. I think reading about him, he seems like an extraordinary guy. I'm surprised I'd never heard of him, for example. But if you're in America and you're eating, say, like peaches or nectarines or avocados or mangoes, most likely the one that you're eating right now, someone's bound to be eating one right now as they listen, shares <laughs> genes from the ones that Fairchild yeah. introduced to the mm, country. That is quite All those cool. years ago. What a, yeah, yeah. what a sort of footprint he's left in, yeah. in the country. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Like, send us your send us your photos if you're reading photos, a, yes, if you're reading a mango now <laughs> right in, now. in America <laughs> or an avocado or an avocado some quinoa yeah <laughs> yeah did he bring in quinoa yep podcast at qi.com we want to see the mango steen yeah. oh great let's talk about this this is great <laughs> go on what, what, what is the mango steen it's a it's a fruit that he introduced mm. and that never took off because he introduced thousands uh, yeah. and they didn't all take off because yeah, you, you can have to still buy mango steens though can't you think so yeah, they just never exploded Wait, i had never heard of the mango steen before i had oh, no really? yeah 
the guy who wrote the book on David Fairchild um, is Dan Stone, who's a friend of mine. Mm. And uh, apparently while he was writing this book, everybody would just send him really exotic <laughs> fruit like, for wow. the whole time he was writing the book because they were like, this is good for you, no? Yeah. He's like, sure. Yeah, the book's <laughs> called The Food Explorer, by the way. I think it it's amazing, fair to say yeah. that every bit of research I have oh, is yeah, from yeah, yeah. Stone. <laughs> so yeah, well done, so, mate. Go on, what tell a us book. about mangosteens, Sandy. Well, as far as I can tell, I, again, I, Dan and I have never heard of them before and you two are like, having them for breakfast every day. So correct me if I'm wrong. But they're the size of a fist, roughly, and they're like a lychee. Brilliant. But but the problem is they're not great for farming. And what, what he was doing, Fairchild, you have to persuade the farmers to grow the things and the public to buy them. Mm. So it's two jobs to yeah, carry out, yeah, basically. Yeah. And he couldn't persuade either, apparently, either side of the equation, because yeah. they're really hard. They, they bruise worse than peaches and they, yeah, they're just yeah. a nightmare to, to transport and and they go off really quickly but he said they were the queen of fruits they were so. his favorite oh, really? i know and he kept trying to make them happen like fetch <laughs> in mean girls mm. <laughs> kept trying yeah. to make it happen and it no one was picking up on it and so all these things he brought into the country but the one of which you headlined your fact with mm. is very interesting because it was the beer hops yeah and mm. you'd think you'd just go into a country grab some fruit and leave the country but no people were so protective they would have you know boys sleeping with the hops at yeah. night to make yeah, sure no one would see security. it yeah. that's the thing so he'd come in and integrate himself with the communities he would sort of become friends so this uh, this particular hop so this is i think the sems hop he he basically started talking about sems the guy that came up with it who was dead at this point and he offered the son of sems basically he said look i'm really scared that in a few generations people aren't going to know about your dad blah 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 so he was like why don't you build a plaque I will pay for it. So he like That's basically clever. put money down. It's impressive US diplomacy here. Mm -hmm. And uh, they made such a song and dance about it. Everybody was really happy. The whole, like everybody in the town was happy about it. And then apparently somebody at night knocks on his door when it's raining and goes, do you want some? Do you want some cuttings? Wow. And apparently he has to like really restrain himself to not be like, yes, this is exactly why I did all this and I've been manipulating you guys for like weeks. Um, and he was like, yeah, okay. And he oh, goes, on, okay, man. I can't do this publicly. Uh, I have to do it quietly, but I'll send a hundred cuttings to the next the next station down the line. Oh, not even handing them over no, now. No, no, yeah, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. It That's was proper clever. espionage. That's amazing. It's hilarious. But also to think like of all the of all the uh, espionage that the US government has ever done. I just I just can't object to this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I and just that's don't why, care. That's why American beer now is so delicious, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, how bad must it have been before? <laughs> so, so here's the crazy thing. Apparently during Prohibition, all his hops were uprooted. Mm, yeah. Um, so all the Sam's hops that Fairchild. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah they yeah, were all uprooted yeah. during the... I read that. Basically, wow. when Prohibition came in, all the breweries closed down. And then when they reopened, there was a few more big ones and they decided to sell what they knew would sell because they weren't sure anyone would buy any beer anymore. And so they went with the really safe stuff, which was the light beers and the mass-produced stuff. Okay, mm. now can you explain Hershey's? Hershey's? <laughs> it tastes like sick. Yeah, it tastes like sick to British people. Or, well, you know, it contains some chemicals which happen to also <laughs> taste like sick. I can't remember the exact I love yeah, how yeah. people have gone around tasting sick. They haven't. They haven't. They really haven't. That's not how well, you, If you're eating a Hershey's bar right now, please send a photo. <laughs> <Or> <laughs> if you're being sick. Yeah. If you're, you know. By the way. Oh, yeah. yes, that one. Yeah. Podcast <laughs> at QR.com. Um, uh, you mentioned... Do they, do they have your address? Because I feel like if they have your address, they could send the mangosteens and the sick etc etc mm. to the address <laughs> we've just moved offices and the yeah. reason being that the old office was just full of sick and mangosteens yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's inundated yeah. yeah but everyone's tasted sick if they've ever been sick true you know. yeah oh, wow. you just taste it in reverse oh. don't you sorry to, I mean, to you know to lower the tone that's nasty yeah. but that's how we know what American chocolate tastes like yeah Great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Did you guys uh, hear about the cherry blossom trees in DC and how yeah, he's responsible no. for all of them, basically? So, I mean, we have them now in London uh, mm -hmm. quite a lot. Yeah. They're very kind of ornamental mm. and very beautiful. But he introduced them from Japan and then it became all the rage and people were like queuing up to see him and Alexander Graham Bell's daughters. Residence. It was at their house, wasn't it? He yeah. put it to his, yeah. Oh. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And then basically Washington DC was not the beautiful metropolis it now is <laughs> oh. um, back then. Oh. It was kind of ugly and uh, he started saying well maybe we should just plant some cherry blossom trees yeah. around here and that would be kind of beautiful and then the uh the first lady heard of this and before you know it the japanese who at this point they're not particularly like chummy with um they're like okay this could be a symbol of friendship if you give us 300 cherry blossom trees mm. we can plant them in dc 
and the Japanese got carried away, ended up shipping 2,000. <gasps> but they opened the crates, I think it was in Seattle, and went, oh crap, they were diseased. They were absolutely infested with invasive mm. species. So then they had to publicly burn the symbol of friendship between Japan oh. and the US. Yeah. And it was like on the front page of the New York Times. And, and the thing I read was it was from orders of the president, which feels <laughs> like he should have been busier than having to make <laughs> executive decisions about, yeah, yeah, yeah. about <laughs> agricultural imports. Although it was his decision, wasn't it? Because it was him and the first lady who kind of made the decision to bring yeah. it over, wasn't it? Mm. Wow. But the Japanese were like, are bad. And so it was all fine. They <laughs> right. sent they sent more over and then they are now. And as a result, yeah. US-Japanese relations stayed very harmonious, didn't they? Yeah. 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 Good. Um, it was interesting because the ones that they sent over the second time, they had to make sure that they were really not infested. Mm. Uh, so they raised the trees in virgin soil. So mm. they the soil was brand new oh. and they'd never been anywhere else. Uh, they wrapped the roots in damp moss um, to stop it's a any work for a friendship man yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's great it's great and they fumigated it twice um once to asphyxiate the insects and then once just in case <laughs> 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 um, but yeah and the reason that they did this is because this guy uh, fairchild had a nemesis called charles marlatt didn't he Yep. This is an amazing story. So Charles Marlatt was in charge of the FDA sort of anti-insect part of the FDA, mm. uh, but they were boyhood friends. And actually Marlatt was Fairchild's best man at his wedding. <gasps> um, but then they fell out because Fairchild basically got a load of easy jobs through his friends and family, a bit of nepotism and stuff. And Marlatt had to work hard for his for his job. And so they really fell out. And Marlatt basically, whenever Fairchild brought in any new species, he mm. would be like, there's insects on that, get rid of it, burn mm. it, do yeah. it now. And so they wow. really, really fell out. I, I have to defend the entomologist, even though I love mm. Dan Fairchild. So it's worth saying that, like, Fairchild, um, he was, he, he did get a lot of fame, but a lot of that was off his own back. But then, yeah, sure, he married into, like, this really prominent family and became really big with National Geographic. Mm. But today we would actually side with the entomologist yeah like he, yeah. scientifically he's the sound one yeah, not yeah. the botanist just being mm. like well let's just hope it's going to be fine when we bring all these parts yeah. from all over the world yeah definitely it but was it was dangerous yeah i read yeah. this amazing story that he wanted to send a thousand mangoes back to um back to america mm. uh, but he put them on a boat and they were too heavy uh, <laughs> and so he solved it by getting a load of local children to eat them all what? Because all he needed were the stones. Brilliant. He didn't need the mangoes themselves. Oh, so brilliant. he just got all the kids and said, free mangoes, as many as you can eat. They all went, nom, 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 nom. US and diplomacy. There we go. That's another. Yeah. That's Sorry. I thought you were going to say something really clever, like he only needed to ship the children there. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then was, they'd poo them out. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I was thinking, God, those children are brave, like pooing out a mango stone. That's not funny. Yeah. And then, no, children famously a bit more heavy than a mango as well. So yeah. weight was your issue. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi, everyone. We'd like to let you know that this week we are sponsored by Squarespace. Yes, Squarespace is the tool that allows you to build and grow your business online. You can make a beautiful website. You can engage with your audience like we're engaging with you now. Yeah, <laughs> you can sell anything, your products, your content, all of it. And Squarespace makes it easy and fun. It's amazing. I always wanted my own domain. Wouldn't it be amazing mm. to have a domain? You could be the king of your domain or queen of your domain. And Squarespace allows you to do that. And it gives you a whole lot of extra stuff to do inside your domain. So you can create <laughs> videos inside your domain. They allow you to connect your social media accounts to your website. It's an absolutely brilliant tool. I've got a question, James. Would it, would it be possible for me to set up a member area inside my domain? <laughs> You know what, Andy? You would be absolutely astonished to find out that, yes, you can do that exact thing. Mm. And even better still, you can go to squarespace.com slash fish and you'll get a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, if you use the offer code fish, you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Right. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Go to squarespace.com slash fish. Try that trial for free and use the offer code FISH when you launch and you'll save 10%. Start your domain now. Okay, on with the podcast. On with the show. 
Okay, it's time for fact number two, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that at one stage of the 17th century, every woman living on the Yemeni island of Socotra was called Maria. Was it? Okay. <laughs> okay. How many women were on the island? Well, I don't know, but it wasn't completely insignificant. It's a big island, right? It's yeah. about yeah. the size of what, Mallorca? Long You've Island. Been there, it's big. Haven't you? Long Island, is yeah. It, is it that they were hosting a Sound of Music reality show? Because <laughs> the 17th century. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's a real Yemeni vibe. It's like the tribesmen <laughs> and the Sound of Music. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I don't know exactly how many people live there. How many people would you say live there now? It's in the 10th, 10th I think it's four, I think it's about 40,000. 40,000, yeah. It's yeah. Quite a few. It would Maybe have been 50, less yeah. then, but basically it was a Christian island. Mm. Um, by tradition, it was St. Thomas who was shipwrecked there in the year 52 AD, okay. and he supposedly brought in Christianity. But definitely mm. the Greeks brought it in the 4th century. That definitely happened. And Marco Polo wrote about it in the 13th century that mm. there were Christians there. And in the 17th century, there was a guy called Padre Vincenzo, uh, and he visited Socotra, and he found that they were still Christian ostensibly, but they kind of moved to other beliefs because Socotra is a place that's very difficult to get to, especially at certain times of year. You can't mm. really get there at all. The monsoon the winds, is, yeah. yeah, good luck. And so because they were isolated from the rest of the world, they kind of had this new version of Christianity. So a lot of them were called Maria. There were still <laughs> a lot of churches, but for instance, they used to do sacrifices to the moon and a few different things. Well, so why they not keep of, some of your old beliefs in? Just yeah. spice it all up a bit. What year was that again? Uh, it was in the mid 17th century. Why were they called Maria? Because Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mm. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That must have been confusing. Oh, yeah. No, because they don't. Have you oh. been there? Have you been there? Yeah, so I've been to Socotra. It is, I can verify that it's very difficult to get there. <laughs> <laughs> have you met a Maria? Uh, I have not met a Maria because weirdly there's no Christians left on the island. No. Whoa. Oh, why is that? Someone said, Maria, come <laughs> over here. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. No, they're all uh, Muslims now. So I uh, went there kind of 2018, I think, or 2019. And we had three options to get there. Either we uh, fly in via mainland Yemen, but the airport we were flying into was an Al-Qaeda stronghold. So decided maybe that's not the best way of getting in. Uh, and then the other route was via a, uh, kind of almost like a private jet via the Emirates, the place that you like. Um, <laughs> but uh, they were only giving us verbal permission, not written permission. Right. Right. Um, and then the third option was to get on a cement cargo ship uh, from Oman and sail through pirate waters. And the ship was like infested with cockroaches, like completely infested. And it, it had like a, a, the toilet was like a basket on the side of the ship, like attached with rope. Is this the route you went? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, it was hilarious. Um, no pirates? We, you... Yeah, we luckily didn't That's didn't lucky. have the, we, Just you know, the cockroaches. Yeah, the the Swede in the group had his wits about him. Let me tell you that every time every time a ship went past, he was like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, just gosh. very nervous. <laughs> but yeah, so it's it's really hard to get to, and that's yeah. the thing, right? But then that's good news for other things. So it means that they have amazing biodiversity there. And yeah, you've oh, seen the trees that are there. They look incredible. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. dragon blood tree. I know that's the most famous really yeah. that's the sort of like the headline tree yeah. out there but they do look it beautiful is amazing they yeah. look they're described if you would want to picture it they're described as sort of looking like umbrellas but a lot of them look like umbrellas with a high wind where you know when your yeah. umbrella yeah. flips inside point. out because yeah. you see the stems coming up and yeah. they're known for the fact that if the sap comes out it's red sap hence the kind of dragon blood thing and they've been exporting that for years and it's been used for all sorts of um like nail polish and and medicines and so on it's in gladiators really, That's really? Thing. gladiators supposedly uh, had a bit of it smeared on them as decoration and a bit as disinfectant um but the, the thing is that the tree wow i think it only exists there now but pollen has been found all around the mediterranean as in oh, fossilized really? or archaeologists have found pollen of it around the med mm. so this is what the med used to look like there used to be these trees much more commonly so the dragon's blood tree there's different species of dragon's blood mm. Um, and there are still what we call in biology relic populations. So kind of populations that are on their last leg in Socotra. But there's different species of dragon's blood in the Canary Islands. Uh, there's another oh. species in Oman and kind of a remote part of Oman. And it looks like the dragon's blood tree was like a really dominant tree right. in, the ho in the whole of the kind of that old world. Mm. Um, it's kind of old school it's it should kind of really be on its out and it is but um, well, it is right they're saying possibly in the next 80 years yeah, yeah, yeah. if we're not careful it's going to be an extinct yeah. species of tree yeah yeah and it's it's so interesting how it survives because most trees obviously get their water through the roots under the ground mm -hmm. but this this tree has 
worked out a way i don't know if that's a language you use about trees but it's yeah. got the ability to take in the moisture of the clouds that are going above it so it can pull from above as so well cool. as below yeah, yeah which is pretty amazing it, it injects much more water into the soil from the air than mm. it gets in rainfall because it's sometimes it's foggy and cloudy and yeah. it sort of yeah. sucks all that it's called horizontal precipitation capture which is as it sounds but they've got nine i think 92 different plant species which live in the undergrowth a few surveys have found that and seven of them oh. are only found wow. living in the undergrowth of the dragon's blood tree so that's mad and so i cool. suppose that would make it an umbrella species <laughs> and it looks like an umbrella no, 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 no. i'll tell you what <laughs> national geographic they're going wild oh, for that kills. yeah yeah i mean it, when you turn up there i'm not gonna lie you're like what is this place it looks there's so few places on earth where you look at them and you go oh that looks really alien like that's mm. that's a really unusual landscape yeah, yeah. um and socotra is definitely that like these canyons like like grand canyon almost obviously not that scale but um with with these dragon blood trees and other trees as well mm. you know and giant snails and a bunch of stuff that you're just like what yeah. is this well ella I, I can i ask you as the only one who's been there yeah did it seem to you at all like the atmosphere of the planet pandora in the Jesus. global mega hit avatar films <laughs> okay okay Actually, this, is a, this is a good it. crowd to ask this because i i've heard that as well that okay, that so, was an I read, inspiration I read it somewhere right and yeah, i yeah. i wondered if if we knew what the source of that was because i could here's the thing yeah. the thing with socotra is if you speak to people that are really in the know so people um the kind of off the beat uh, travelers people that are very interested in kind of biology that kind of thing mm. they all know socotra it's like this this hidden right. secret that actually everybody in a certain industry knows about like right. it's you know and it's on people's dream i've met very rich people that are desperate for me to take them to socotra and i'm like sure once i've dealt with the pirate situation i will get you yeah. and you're very it's rich queue, queue of wizard <laughs> texans just waiting to be um but yeah i wondered about that because i was i can see that but i just wonder what the source is because i just yeah. being that we care about facts here guys right mm. right yeah. Right, I sure. need more. <laughs> well, there's one thing we care about more than facts, and that's the continued success of the Way of Water franchise. <laughs> <laughs> never mind, never mind, never mind. Uh, just on the Christianity in Yemen in the 17th century, this was uh, what Padre Vincenzo was talking about. Um, a few weird things that they did. They had a priest called an Adambo who was elected by the people and changed every single year. She's like almost what? like an archbishop of the of the um, island, but democratic. Mm. That's quite cool, isn't yeah, it? Let cool. me tell you about modern day Yemen. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, in the churches, they had like a uh, what would you call it, like an altar, and every day they would smear it with butter. Oh, lovely! Yeah, that does sound great. Kind of... What for? What reason? What for, yeah, do they slide along it? <laughs> or... Yeah. <laughs> Because that'd be a great way of starting a service, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, whoosh, I'm here. Or is it sort of like you're going up for your body of Christ? Would you like, would you like some butter? <laughs> I love how this is just the fantasies that these two have. <laughs> <laughs> That's what would take those two heathens back to church. <laughs> I've got a general Yemen fact. Oh, yeah. Go, yeah. During, so Ye Yemen, I think, used to be a British colony protectorate, protectorate. that's the south safe of to it. say about anywhere in the world yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. the british were, were in, involved in some <laughs> well you know yeah are they so during during that era the the port of aden which was and i think even after the rest of yemen might have gained independence aden maintained a kind of special yeah. status basically aden was in a, a pretty constant state of emergency things were so dicey there that British citizens living there were issued pretty much as standard with revolvers in case of assassination attempts on them. Imagine that. Imagine just uh, moving to somewhere and being fitted with a revolver. Yeah, Yemen's an interesting place. Like uh, during, uh, so there was a revolution and obviously now there's a war mm. um, and there was like a protest uh, and outside the protest it says um, no bazookas. <laughs> so you're allowed wow. to Wow. <laughs> Uh, other way, but just no bazooka. We're drawing the line of bazooka. Oh, and landmines. Um, there were like That's no bazookas amazing. and no um, no hand grenades. Oh my mines. god! That's so yeah, funny because yeah. like we just had protests here, and if you brought like a, a whistle, a whistle or a luggage tag, <laughs> they kind of ship yeah, you away yeah. to prison. No, yeah. no, no, no. But in defence wow. of my parents' homeland, I will say uh, it is a. It, like, have you seen pictures of mainland Yemen and the island of Scotland? It's the most stunning place, and I know like mm. I'm biased, but 
It is absolutely epic. Well, beautiful. I saw a photo of a place. I wonder if you've seen it in person. You've been there quite a few times, mm. right? Um, it's described as the Manhattan of the desert. Yes. I mean, it sounds incredible. That was Freya Stark, explorer, who called it that in the 1930s. But this is a 16th century walled city mm. that was the first ever city of skyscrapers. They went seven floors high and mm. the buildings were made of mud. It was just a yeah. And higher, actually. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and there's still, obviously, there's been renovations and so on. But is there anything original? Oh, it's all there. Yeah, wow, yeah. So it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Again, it's, so it's, it's so Socotra is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it's basically um, buildings 10, 11, whatever stories high. Um, the really cute thing is that um, some of those houses have bridges. Yeah. On the top of the houses nice. because people can't be bothered to go all the way downstairs because they don't have elevators. They're like, right. Clever. Historic buildings, right? So they instead of going all the way downstairs to go visit the neighbours, they just go to the to the to the top, <sighs> which they clear. call the Jumba, and they just leg it along these little bridges. And it's still just, but the thing is it's so old and it's still inhabited. That's the amazing. Oh no, it's like, inhabited. It's, amazing. it's, it's completely so inhabited. Amazing. Yeah. It's a lived in world heritage site. It's great. I mean when you turn up there, you're like, Are you kidding? Wow. <laughs> so bazookas and pistols, yes, <laughs> but also heritage. It was yeah. the um... Go visit, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it was the only place you could get coffee from for 200 years until wow. one of these people who stole plants oh, went oh, in. Oh, your <laughs> heroes, Suddenly, Ella. I yeah. don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> went in, nicked all the coffee. Uh, and if Mocha, which is the place where the coffee was exported from, if they still had the monopoly on coffee, there would be enough money for everyone in Yemen to get a payment of $16,000 per year on top of anything else they earned. Are you earned. kidding me? And that would be eight times higher than the actual average salary of the person from Yemen. Wow. So, yeah. Oh, man. That's depressing. Um, Just one more thing on Mary's. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mm. At the end of the 18th century, 24% of women in England were called Mary. Mm. Um, The Socotra of the North, they (laughs) called it. Uh, And in Vexan, which is in France, just northwest of Paris, uh, in 1740, 68.4% of women were called Mary. What? Or Marie, it would be. Yeah. Mm. Do any of you have Marias in your families? My, I have a cousin. Yeah, my uh, Rosemary is my auntie. Yeah. So there's. Yeah, I wonder if it's that. If it's the double barrel first. Well, name. in France, that's what happened. Yeah. So around that time, around the 18th century, they started doing the double names, so you could have Marie Claire or Marie whatever. Oh yeah. Uh, and yeah, so they started. Almost everyone was called Marie something. Oh. In um, 8, 1379, 33 percent of the male population of Sheffield were called John. Oh. Uh, and 22% of the women were called Alice. Mm. Mm. John and Alice have invited us round. <laughs> Be more specific! <laughs> <laughs> That's us! <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is Andy. My fact is that during the Second World War, the making of Spitfires was so secret that one married couple didn't know they were both working on it. Was that John and Alice? <laughs> it was John and Alice. <laughs> That's cool. So, it's did, so I wonder if they both thought that the other was having an affair. I know. Imagine them going to work in the morning. Like, <laughs> off to work. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Okay. See you later. Sure. I'm going in this direction. Oh, um... <laughs> I'll, I'll just pop back to the house for a minute. <laughs> was there someone at work whose job it was to keep them apart as well? <laughs> a nightmare life of they're coming to the canteen at the same time. Oh, uh, hey, why did you come and... Uh... It's, it's did, such a weird fact. How yeah. did they find out? So they many found questions. out decades later. That's the crazy thing. So this is a slight, Was this that is the a, only secret thing they were working? I have so many questions. Was that the only secret thing they were working on? I think they were both working in this specific factory. So the, the, the same factory, even. Yeah, it was the same factory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the th- so this. I mean, is, they might be idiots, guys. It's possible. <laughs> Basically, for anyone who doesn't know, we're talking about the Spitfire, the Supermarine Spitfire's legendary plane of the Second World War. You know, big, big, big thing in Britain, big kind of national myth item in Britain, the Spitfire. And there was a factory in Southampton which made, I think, most of the Spitfires. And it was bombed in 1940 by the Luftwaffe. And it was not just bombed, it was flattened. And this was a disaster. And they needed to work out how to, you know, keep Spitfire production going, but keep it safe from bombing raids. And what they did was they said, well, we'll we'll make it in secret. And not only that, we'll divide all the factories into, you know, lots of different tiny micro factories around the place, which Mm. are all hidden. So they used all sorts of little offices or garages, a laundry, an old glove factory. They just (laughs) divide. It was amazing. They just Mm. divided it up. And lots of them were in Salisbury and Reading and Trowbridge and just like all over the place, basically. And this came out decades after the war that this is how it had been done, basically. 
and um, there was an engineer who worked on them called Norman Parker. And he said in 2021, he was interviewed about it. Uh, he was about 95 at the time that he was talking about this. He said, we had one case. There was a couple at a dinner party in the 1970s. And over the dinner table, the wife said, oh, I was building Spitfires in Salisbury during the war. And the husband said, no, you weren't. I was. <laughs> and they had both been working in the same factory and they didn't know it. It could be guess... a false memory, couldn't it? I guess. I, I think this is a really bad marriage, guys. Yeah. I, I, I've got... <laughs> well, there are a number of things it could have been, but basically... <laughs> Yeah, I reckon I have things with my siblings that we talk about when we were really, really young, and we all think that we were the one who did a certain thing. Oh, right. Do you know what I mean, you're throwing. Like, sh- yeah, I see you're throwing shade on the. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that's now. true, but I'm just saying like I remember like I was, you know, my brother was locked in a toilet in France when we went to a restaurant once and we had to get mm. him out, and then he thinks it was my sister who was that. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, mm. yeah, weird, eh? Yeah, yeah. Or it could be that they're both that they're telling the truth and it's a real thing oh my god <laughs> do we know what they worked on specifically well i think that's the other thing production was divvied up yeah in lots of yeah. ways so it might have been by same factory it was a you know factory make- it was at different sites or it was a you know they probably weren't in the same room he could have been making know. the leather chairs for what could be used for a car but was for a plane and as in like it's, sure yeah, like, yeah that's yeah. what i mean to the level of what were they making exactly the yeah. Spitfire. yeah and people were it's people, plausible yeah. for sure isn't yeah yeah it? yeah I mean, it's I think they sort and of dug into very it. Secretive. And people were very secretive. Or, or you might know in a couple, I'm working on something that's secret and I can't really tell you what it's about. And and they're, they're both in war work. And the thing is about aviation, during the Second World War, 65% of the aviation f- workforce were women because mm, most yeah. of the men were. So in statistically, the army. she's more likely to be correct. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I, like I say, I think they're both correct. <laughs> So she's told this guy at the dinner table, he's gone, wow, what an amazing life. What did you do? Uh, yeah, yeah, Spitfires as well. Uh, 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 uh. So anyway, the Spitfire. Brilliant. Spitfire is okay. amazing. So are you into the Spitfire? Yeah. Because I not... feel like I don't, I feel, how do I put this politely? I, the people that talk about Spitfires a lot tend to be a few years older than you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's actually a compliment, guys. I don't know if you heard. That was, uh, <laughs> I'm young-seeming young, young seeming for a guy as interested in Spitfires. <laughs> I'm not so, like I'm not, my teacher yeah. at school when I was a kid right. who was an older yeah, guy yeah. was really into Spitfires I think actually Ella you'll find the more that you meet Andy and talk to him <laughs> he's an old man well a lot of the things he's interested in you would expect older men to be interested in <laughs> is that fair to say? I think it's not unfair <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm not I'm not really I'm not deeply into them but I am in- interested in logistics uh, I love how you're so, I love <laughs> So for those who can't see this, he might be shaking a little bit as he said, I'm, I'm not really, really into it. But I'm, I'm, I'm trembling with joy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can't be- I had a look at, just, you know, we check what we've talked yeah. about before in this podcast. Mm. I had a look. I can't believe you guys have stopped me for nine years from ever mentioning the Spitfire on this show. We've never mentioned it. Well done, guys. Yeah. High five the rest yeah. of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, uh, great plane. A, yeah, incredible plane. And also, um, what a group effort of the UK during wartime to make this plane built to the numbers that it was built at. Basically, yeah. there was... I was reading an article saying that it was effectively like one of the early Kickstarters where people yeah. funded whole communities would go around funding single planes and and they as a result got to name the plane so lots of the planes flying that were in the war had names like Dorothy of Great Britain and Empire and that was funded entirely by women called Dorothy so <laughs> it's so <laughs> yeah. yes it's so funny where is the Maria plane yeah but in fairness <laughs> 70% of women were called Dorothy <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, the dog fighter as well um, there was, uh, was that and that fun- was the kennel club who oh had right it wasn't people that. who did dog fighting <laughs> no people from the back of the pub <laughs> but check, check this out this is this is the most incredible one there was one that was uh, POWs of Offlag this is a prison camp in Germany that yeah. captured off- officers who donated their month's pay through the Red Cross then that went into the building of a plane so they I were know. in prison what? and they were funding the plane that's that was then a war yeah, I read about that and it's they had to send letters back saying I want to give my money to this crowdfunding right yeah but they had to do it in code so because oh. you couldn't send a message that the Germans would be able to read saying please put all my money into Spitfires <laughs> otherwise they're just going to accidentally lose it aren't they so yeah, exactly it's amazing it was that was a really nice thing this crowdfunding effort yeah. which I'd not heard what of what would they have called it back then though? it wouldn't have been crowdfunding it, they surely. were called Spitfire funds 
Um, and the planes were kind of arbitrarily priced. They said five thousand pounds will buy a Spitfire, which was not actually a true figure, but it sort of was a peg for yeah, people yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. But also that thing of charities these days will say two pounds will buy a meal for one. Thing. Yeah, it was, it was like, like sixpence will buy a rivet. Exactly, and two thousand pounds will get you a wing. No, so you yeah. can see the what you were buying. It raised a lot of lot of money. It was nearly given a much less sexy name than the Spitfire. Okay. Spitfire is quite a swashbuckling name. Uh, other contenders included Scarab, uh, Shrike. Which is quite good because that's yeah, a bird that bird. impales yeah. its prey. You know, it's quite sort of. Um, but I looked up the the complete list of supermarine aircraft, and there were some many there were many bad options that the Spitfire could have been called. There was the supermarine commercial amphibian, wow. the supermarine <laughs> sea urchin, uh-huh. supermarine spiteful, <laughs> sure, quite good, supermarine seagull, supermarine sea otter, and the no, they're all real, <laughs> and the supermarine baby. Oh. No. Yeah, I know. In a brainstorm, sometimes there are bad ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Unleash the babies. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they mostly began with S, and they were mostly seaplanes. That's what they started out yeah. as. The firm started out making seaplanes, and so, we, yeah. I love seaplanes. Yeah, they're cool. Mm. Imagine they're a plane where you can just land anywhere. Mm. As yes. long as there's a body of water, you just land. So not on land. Yeah, well, you're... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry no, Dan suddenly yeah. brings the facts. Oh, you get <laughs> special life jackets in case you land on land. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, these um, supermarine, supermarine Spitfires, mm. uh, when they were taxiing, uh, so just kind of driving around the uh, the airport, they quite often sort of oh, not overturn, but get really wobbly. Mm. And so what would happen is someone would often sit on the tail of the plane to keep them steady. <laughs> mm. uh, and it was often a woman who did this and uh, there was a particular woman called Margaret Horton who did this in 1943 at RAF Heibelstow uh, and she was sat on the back and the guy was a little bit anxious to get in the air and forgot no. to get her off the no. tail no. No. <laughs> no. so started taking off while she was sitting on the tail of the Spitfire and he radioed down to traffic control saying oh there's something wrong with this plane it's, like, <laughs> oh. it's kind of yeah, really, it's really heavy, heavy. It's like, <laughs> yeah. uh, and so they she talked hanging him, on yeah yeah, yeah. so oh they talked God. him down but they, they never him told down. him that there was a woman on the <gasps> back oh no they, way well because as soon as they tell him he's gonna be yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. Right? yeah. So, true. so they're like oh yeah there's obviously a problem with the wing we'll just right. talk you down on how to get down and so he never oh. knew until he landed that this woman was bloody hell like, and she survived to the- <laughs> she survived yeah, she survived yeah. there's there's of a course. museum called Tagmir Military Aviation Museum and when you go to it there's a model that they've made so you can see a model of a um, Spitfire taking off with this woman <laughs> <laughs> a little plasticine woman or whatever the material is <laughs> holding on to the tail wing <laughs> so funny <laughs> it's so brilliant God. should we say why it was so good I guess we're, I'm like, intrigued. Yeah. So, I, so apparently, all the pilots loved it. But I'm like, what? Why? Yeah. Why did they all love it? Well, it was it was it was really nimble. It turned very very fast. And also, the other thing about it was it was um, it flew very very fast. Partly because, <laughs> okay, this is quite niche. If you guys want to tease me when I say this bit, I don't mind. Okay. Right. But basically, the it had flush riveting, which is a good. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Ooh. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Dear listener, um, no, the, the, so the metal skin, very, very cool. But if you had lumpy rivets all over it, which most planes yeah, did before yeah. that, uh-huh. it drags the plane back a bit. Whereas if you sink these little countersunk rivets, so you sort of it's exactly level with the surface of the plane, then yeah. the airflow is very efficient and you get a much faster plane. Clever. And they did some experiments on early Spitfires. They replicated what it would be like if it had external rivets by gluing split peas onto the spots where the rivets were all over the plane and then flying it, doing a speed test, basically. And it was about 20, 22 miles an hour slower. It was a, a wow. fair chunk slower, yeah, yeah, which yeah. would have had a serious effect if you were in a, a combat situation. And you know, yeah. So, yeah. Could so, you yeah. have, um, like, stopped the enemy by going in and putting peas on his <laughs> yeah, plane? Yeah, definitely. That was, a big part, that was a big part of the early SAS job. Was, <laughs> was uh, yeah. <laughs> I used to do that, and so did my wife. <laughs> so um, that fact would be even more impressive if I knew what a rivet was. <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you've got to retain some mystery, I'm afraid. Uh, That's still under the secrets act, actually. Um, what the hell's a rivet? A, a kind of screw. Kind of screw. It's like what? a big old screw. It joins joins the, the bits of the plane to the other bits I'm of the googling plane. Googling rivet. <laughs> That's so funny. You uh, know the word riveting? It's got nothing to do no. with what a rivet oh. is. <laughs> Hold on, rivet. She's googling. I know it's because it, it holds you together. Different. It holds you. In. It holds yeah, you yeah, in yeah. place. Yeah, you're right. This is a, yeah. They're just a, it's a kind of screw. Great. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. 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 Message in if you didn't know what a rivet. Was. I can. 
And if you like, I can repeat that fact for you now, Ella, and it'll be even more exciting this time round. Should we move on? Or? Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly what? mention it. <laughs> I feel like we've got enough. Have I haven't read done? a tenth of my stuff out. <laughs> I haven't told you about the supermarine walrus. It so feels- it's just out of interest. Like, what, yeah. what are your subjects that they won't let you normally talk about? I just need to know, like, it's, how valid. It's mostly second world war logistics. Yeah. <laughs> We end up letting him do it because he does crowbar it in somehow into any old fact. So um, here's a question for you. Do you yeah. do you follow current war strategy and logistics? Like yes. I've got a whole bunch yeah. of male friends who are so into the logistics of the Ukrainian war that it's gone beyond anything that I think is normal. Um, mm. you'd, you'd, oh. have to, you'd have to ask my wife what, what's normal <laughs> in terms of what... So it's, it's, it's past and present. I think logistics, logistics is interesting. As the... <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm blushing now, but actually, I'm logistics not ashamed. Is interesting needs to go on your tombstone. We can't all be. We can't all be bloody explorers, you know, on cool cement ships. I'm going to stay on the cement ship. Thank would you. I don't you, want to see Socotra. Look at the rivets on Andy's tombstone. <laughs> oh, oh my dear. god. We've been so mean. No, Look, no. some people need to be in logistics. Just well, actually, James is right. We're not actually out of time, but we should move on. Um, oh, can I tell, can I tell you one more like a sort of yeah s- Spitfire yeah. hero? He actually wrote a book partly about the Spitfire. Yeah. Uh, Douglas Bader. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now, he was really he was a really famous pilot. Partly yeah. because I think it was in I don't know if it was an accident. Well, he famously had no legs. He had no legs, right. but yeah, he lost nonetheless both his legs during mission fly, flight. Yeah, flying yeah. accident. Yeah, yeah, fly, flying incidents, and he became a Spitfire ace nonetheless. In the Second World War, he was shot down over France, and he ejected, so he he survived. But he lost one of his prosthetic legs in the course of oh, being shot down. Well, no, he was treated with a lot of respect by the Germans yeah. who captured him oh. because there were rules about that. And he was in a prisoner of war camp. And Goering, who was the head of the Luftwaffe, gave special permission for an artificial leg, a spare leg, to be parachuted into his prisoner of war camp. Oh, amazing! Nice. Yeah, I think what happened was though he kept you, he kept trying to escape, and so they yeah. confiscated his <laughs> yes, his they prosthetic did. Prosthetic yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was before the relationship soured, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that was called Operation Leg. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Where do they come up with the um, th- There's one other hero we should mention, which is Lady Houston. Lady oh, yeah. Houston's sort of the reason that the Spitfire yeah. became the Spitfire during the war. She was a suffragette, political activist. Um, she also was one of the richest women in the UK, if not the richest at one point. And she was someone who kept helping out with war efforts. She was always donating things. I think the, um, the war people didn't like her very much right because right. she kept saying that the you know they weren't giving enough money to the war effort they weren't giving enough equipment all that kind of stuff and she would go around with placards saying give them more guns kind of thing and they got really annoyed but she did like get a lot of money together and i think are you going to say that she helped to pay for the design of the spitfire yeah Yeah. basically what it was was there was a thing called the snyder trophy which was a a biannual international airspeed race and britain won it twice and the idea was if they won the third one they would get to keep the trophy for good but at this point the government said we're not going to fund this stuff we need all the money and she thought that was a huge mistake it's a bit of a like this is a crazy wonder weapon idea it's not gonna like this is a mad waste of money it was was in a depression it was yeah yeah. this was this was in uh, like late 20s early 30s yeah. this was before the Ex- yeah, yeah. exactly and so she said well no that that shouldn't be the case so she funded it she funded it for it to go ahead and as a result rolls royce developed a new engine that became the spitfire's engine and so on so it was down to her and and making that happen yeah. she was the wizened old texan of her day yeah she, she was <laughs> exactly <laughs> But they're wonderful. Let me tell you, if you've got some money, lose some of it with me. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a Patreon, just to say. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hello, everybody. James and Andy here, just letting you know that this week's fish is sponsored by Express VPN. Absolutely. Did you know, Andrew, that what you watch on Netflix in the UK might be different to what someone in Italy or in South Korea might see on their Netflix? Well, actually, James, I exclusively watch Italian and South Korean (laughs) dramas and reality shows, so I'm afraid not. (laughs) 
Well, I actually do watch quite a lot of uh, South Korean reality shows. I watched one called Run for the Money quite recently and another one called Mm -hmm. Siren, both on Netflix. And I'm really excited to see what else is coming out of South Korea and Japan at the moment. And so how on earth am I going to get these new shows? Um, James, have you considered using ExpressVPN and in particular (laughs) the ExpressVPN app? Which allows you to change your online location. Brilliant. Have you considered that? Uh, well, you know what? I probably should have thought of it. And I should yeah. have known that that would be the answer to my <laughs> somewhat rhetorical question. <laughs> But if you would like to see what is happening on various streaming services all around the world, then mm-hmm. getting a VPN is the thing to do. And ExpressVPN is a very, very good example of them. And you can go to expressvpn.com fish right now. And if you do so, you can get an extra three months for free. That's exactly right. Go to expressvpn. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash fish. And if you buy a subscription there, I think a year subscription, you'll get an extra extra three entire months for free okay on with the podcast on with the show okay it's time for our final fact of the show and that is my fact my fact this week is that one of the original names proposed for what we now know as neanderthals was homo stupidus (laughs) (laughs) brilliant (laughs) Yeah, so this was in the early days when we were finding skulls of what was then thought like, is this a bear? Is this a sort of just, a, like, no one knew what <laughs> it's a plane. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was a point where we were finding lots of skulls and we didn't quite know what this thing was. It would later turn out to be Neanderthals. Right. Um, and when they got to a point where they were thinking, okay, actually, we do have a new different species of Homo here. We need to give it a name. But by the look of it and by the skeletons that had been found, it looked like a very clumsy, bulky idiot. Uh, <laughs> and so a very famous scientist at the time, Ernest Haeckel, suggested why not call it Homo stupidus to really <laughs> dig home that this this is why this moron is no longer right. existing mm. on our planet. Now we now know that this is completely wrong, that Neanderthals were actually very intelligent. They did art. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could sing, perhaps. You know, There's lots of things that we're discovering more and more about them. They used um, yeah. penicillin even, like a old what? version of penicillin. I mean, prehistoric version. Prehistoric. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Not yeah. over the counter stuff. These sure. Guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, you're, you're a Neanderthal expert, yeah. Ella. So yeah. I have a number of questions. Um, one is... Um... <laughs> I feel we're doing this the wrong way around. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is definitely targeted at you three. Um, so when you have the guest on, um, are the topics always consistently the topics <laughs> that they are specialists in? And if so, why did I get a Spitfire? <laughs> <laughs> I think we try... We try a bit we of inside tried. baseball. We try to do f- things that our guests are going to know a lot about. Yeah. On your that- Wikipedia page, it says you're an expert in rivets. <laughs> <laughs> Please nobody edit it. <laughs> There's already a whole bunch of untruths on that page. <laughs> um, but sometimes a little fact about maybe logistics or... or- <laughs> Or military strategy will just slip through like that. I wish this was being filmed because your face. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, no. That the the thing with um, so taxonomy is a um, is the system of naming things in biology, hmm. and there's this rule called it's, it's an a priori thing, um, and what it means is that if we find a fossil today. Um, and we call it something that is the name it is given if it becomes a species so if i find a fossil today and i go oh it might be homo sapien or it might be homo schreiber okay (laughs) we already had a homo stupidus (laughs) (laughs) then then let's say there's this but i i publish it yeah if i publish it yeah in, in any journal then later on Um, if people are still like, no, 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 we don't think that's a separate species. If suddenly two more of them are found that really do look similar and somebody goes, no, actually, we really do think that now needs to be um, a a species, they can't go, well, we want to call it, you know, homo, whatever. No, no, the a priori rule is very clear. It has to be called that. So luckily, homo neanderthalensis must have got in there earlier because otherwise we would be stuck with that bloody name. Yeah, Yeah. it was proposed. It was never seriously taken to a board. It was a guy called Dr. William King who was an Irish geologist who eventually... Uh, was the one who said let's call it Neanderthal because it was found the the particular one they were looking at uh, found in 1856 at the Neander River Valley and so it was named after the area yeah Yeah. Yeah. and Thal is uh, valley isn't it I didn't know that oh I didn't know that as in Neander Neander Valley Thal it was in the Neander Valley wow that's all 
So um, the Homo neanderthalensis is what we call it now. Yeah. Uh, but some people call it Homo sapiens neanderthalensis yeah. because it might be a subspecies of Homo sapien. If it was called Homo sapiens stupidus, then that would literally be stupid wise man. Oh, yeah. Oh. Because sapiens means wise. Yes. And that would have been quite a... Yeah. Do, I don't actually know how sapiens was picked because it does feel like we've given ourselves the nice... Well, we bargain, are you know. aren't we? Yeah, of we are like, we we're, did. yeah, we're great. But I'm just saying, it's <laughs> a bit. We're the naming, we're the naming kind of... committee. Of course, we're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Some people said once I, that the brain is the only thing that named itself. Mm. Yeah, which I think is nice. So, brain must be a really good word for it. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually a rubbish word, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think your brain would have come up with something better than that. Yeah, idiot. I, one of the names that the Neanderthal could have had was Gibraltar man, Homo Gibraltaris, or whatever, right. because okay. the first, I think, the first skulls were found in Gibraltar, but they were found too early, and they were found by I think a soldier, and he was a soldier and geologist, and he. And he said, I think this might be something new, but he, he, he didn't really get anywhere, you know. Yeah, um, I think there was a few that were found technically before, but they just didn't identify that. I think there was one in, Sh I think the Spi one as well, which is Belgium. I think that's also an early one. Yeah. Where they just didn't. Um, oh, yeah. Flint. Sorry, Flint was his name. Edmund Flint, which is a nice oh, sort okay. of prehistoric sounding name. Yeah. Or, you know, like a, <laughs> he sounds yeah, yeah. like he's from the Flintstones. <laughs> yeah, he does, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah. And he, he found it, but again, he didn't get anywhere. And actually, I think the last Neanderthals also lived in Gibraltar. Well, yeah. That's, mm, oh. I would disagree with that. Oh. Ooh. Ooh, go on. Okay. No, I think so. I think the team out there really believe that, but I don't okay. think most of the rest of us believe that. Oh, I think we think it's a toss up. It might have been the Iberian Peninsula, but I just, yeah. Was it somewhere islandy where things kind of cling on a bit? Yeah, or it was, was probably it... just the south, but also we just don't know, actually. Mm. The, the dates are constantly shifting. When I say that, I mean that when um, the scientists are dating them, um, they're realizing that all the dates we thought we had are kind of yeah. <laughs> not as great, shall we say. Uh, there's many question marks about these dates. I was reading okay. about a Neanderthal site in Croatia mm. uh, called Krapina Cave. Yeah. Uh, and what I found Krapina. is that they, they found <laughs> coprolites in there. So uh, <laughs> that suggests that Neanderthals might have actually crapped in a cave. Do you, know Do you know what? It would take you lot for me to realize that Krapina, which is an integral part of my research, <laughs> is actually Krapina. <laughs> I had never in all my wow. years realised that before. That's so good. Thank you. You're very Don't welcome. really appreciate yeah. that. I'm not going to high five you. Though. Sometimes it takes a fool to teach a wise woman. A stupidest. Mm. <laughs> Ella, do you know whether or not you're a bit Neanderthal? Yeah, yeah. I got tested. Yeah. What's your What's your number? I don't know. Can't remember. You can't remember. You study Neanderthals remember. and you couldn't be bothered I to. I can't remember retaining it. It was It was averageish. As far as right. I remember, Couple, is that what I'm two percent? Two percent. Yeah. Two percent, okay. and you can do that. So the National Geographic Society they have a genographic project where you do a swab in your mouth and you send it in, and then they can give you the results and tell right. you whether you're not. And then I think we've, we, you know, we know Ozzy Osbourne is a bit yeah, 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 yeah. Um, We all, I mean, we mostly are. Uh, is it everyone outside Africa is a couple of percent, and that because early humans left Africa bred with Neanderthals, yeah. those populations spread yeah. to like Europe, yeah. Asia. But then, so is it called ghost DNA? I love yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even people in Africa these days have kind of a small fraction of a percent of Neanderthal DNA. Well, so so there's a few things going on there. One is that, um, yes, it's it's so everybody outside of sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, so like okay. the Tunisians have got some, you know, the Egyptians have got some. Okay. And what it is is Neanderthals were a more European Asian species and never went into Africa. So it was, it was that's why sub-Saharans don't really have it. Right. The ghost DNA, so this is really cool. So now uh, ancient DNA is so fascinating that they have been able to identify that there are other species out there called Homo God knows what, yeah. um, but they just don't have a single fossil for it. They don't know anything huh. about this, but they know based on looking at all of our DNA globally, there were other species that we interbred with and we just don't know. So we know that we so interbred cool. with Neanderthals. We know that we interbred with a species called Denisova. And then yeah, in, in the process of doing all this, they've also come across a few ghost lineages. That's and so they're cool. like, how do you marry it up with the fossils that are out there? Cause yeah. you're like, I don't know what it looks like. So can we, do we not name it until we find a fossil? Or so some, so in genetics, if it's a ghost lineage, they tend to like give it like population Y or population X or yeah. that kind of thing. They don't give it a name because they really don't know. You've got to give it a cooler name than that, <laughs> you know. Well, that, yeah, that's the whole point. It's a standby name, isn't it? Oh yeah, I see. And yeah. they'll come up with a really. Do you like, want to come up with a awesome. cool name first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you're right. But, but like, imagine if, like, so you've got Homo naledi, which is a new species that they okay. discovered in South uh, Africa, and that might be the ghost lineage. Oh. 
but yeah. well, that might be one of them but we just we, we don't know because until we've got dna we can't compare the two a dna from a, a from fossil a lady. yeah 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 you need the dna you need dna from the fossils you've got to be able to compare it to this ghost lineage. So it might be from home. It might home be Naledi. 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 It might be Naledi. We just don't know. Oh, it's so cool. So the guy cool. that found Naledi, uh, Lee Berger, is like, I reckon it is. Mm. But we were like, maybe. We don't know, though. Yeah. So I got very excited. No, it is exciting. It's <laughs> do you, incredible. Do you know, is his name Svante Pabo? Svante Pabo, yeah. So he's a Swedish DNA expert. And he, mm. I think, he, did he start the field of extracting DNA yeah. from ancient bones? He just won a Nobel Prize for it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, congratulations, Professor oh, well, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was really funny because he won it for medicine, and everybody and everybody <laughs> went, "We, we just had COVID. What? <laughs> we just had COVID, and you've given it to this guy who's found Neanderthal DNA." <laughs> Slow clap. <laughs> he published this study, and you know, he 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 realised that you could extract DNA from old bones, and that's a huge realisation. He worked out how to do it as well, and he got letters, lots of letters from men <laughs> saying. <laughs> I think I'm Neanderthal, actually. I think I'm... Uh, yeah. He said fully or partly Neanderthal. Fully. And set, like, offering him samples to analyse for his work. Yeah, yeah, right. I, know, kind of I think spit samples. I think... Oh, uh, no. but, okay. And, but there was a really interesting... There's, a, there's definitely a gender divide here because mm. 12 women wrote in to him to say, yeah. my husband is definitely... He's a Neanderthal. <laughs> you can study him if you like. Uh, only two men wrote saying the same of their wives... And I don't know if any women wrote in saying I'm a ne- I think I'm pretty sure I'm a Neanderthal. Right. Okay. So there's an interesting thing about how we think yeah. of Neanderthals today. Yeah, That's yeah. what it tells us yeah. about. Really. Yeah. Yeah. So, fair enough. That's actually so true because sorry, I pointed at you very aggressively then. But um, Andy, oh. just for the listeners. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, I made a, a show called Neanderthals for the BBC and PBS, and um, oh. With uh, Andy Circus, with Andy Circus, yeah. who is Gollum in Lord of the Rings, yeah, and a million other things. Like the guy's yeah, got yeah. a very impressive resume. Um, and there was this really big discussion because we were like, blatantly, you're going to make the reconstruction is going to be a male, but actually, mm. why huh. are the reconstructions of cave men? always Ooh. men mm. like it doesn't make, like think about the descent of man image where it's like you know from ape to human mm. it's always just men and it's like well they definitely didn't do that on their own right so <laughs> it's like where are the women in this and we had a really big discussion and in the end we did we did make a man and we called it ned um, but we did make a nelly but the nelly was not of the same quality okay. <laughs> but the animation yeah. wasn't it wasn't Badly andy ended. circus's work let's just put it like yeah, that yeah. was andy circus playing the motion capture yeah so he, he brought the neanderthal to life basically did he co-host as he, he was he was no 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 he was okay. he there's this scene where he actually i love this scene it kind of gives me goosebumps when i see it where he wakes the neanderthal up from his slumber so it's an iraqi neanderthal and he wakes it up from its slumber oh, so wow. he's used it he's like andy's freaking yeah, yeah, circus wow. was and he, he both of the the male and the female no 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 they literally oh, he they, was they, like, forgotten about yeah. not but, yeah. in your oh. nelly no 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 no, no, no. <laughs> no. But I he was, do wish he co-hosted it as the end of yeah. Yeah, that. Should have been El Shamahi. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you guys know why Neanderthals have got such a bad rep? Oh, uh, oh was it? Oh, um, didn't they find what were effectively, unfortunately, deformed yeah. skeletons and so on? And yeah, and so we just thought, ah, oh, that must be yeah. what they all look like. Yeah. Oh. So basically, it oh. was uh, it was a, uh, it was an individual uh, La Chabalo saying, "Don't query my French," um, and um, it was a highly arthritic individual. Um, it was it was an old man, although I'm pretty sure it was only like 40, but you know, old for the time, mm. um, but very young for today. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, and they basically, he was- I don't like the way you looked at me when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, he was highly arthritic and there's a number of things going on here, um, but the the guy who did the, the, the reconstruction of this fossil um, basically portrayed it as being like essentially knuckle dragging. Well, mm. it kind of of right. its heads jutting forward it's you know its knees mm. are bent blah 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 um and then they obviously realized later on that that was completely incorrect but it was too late it was like it got out there that this right. is and because we were looking for a missing link in inverted commas right mm. so it kind of fit the narrative and it was a new field right reconstructing what somebody looked yeah, like from a fossil right. was such a new field that, that you know mm. and so essentially it's everybody's speculating since as to why he did such a bad job which is really embarrassing because oh, his legacy yeah. amongst other things because he's quite a you know renowned person is that he basically did an awful pr job on neanderthals oh, oh, it's amazing that. like if just like for instance in a million years time they find humans and they only find my body yeah, oh, yeah. 
I have very bad sinuses, right? They're just right. going to think all humans had a cold all the time. Mm. That's it. Isn't yeah, it? You that's, know, it. that's yeah, basically yeah, yeah. what happened. That's completely. They're going to find Dan's body and think all humans were unbelievably hairy. Yeah, They'll think, oh, wait. The, 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 I, I love how you guys don't know how bodies and decomposition works. But sure, yeah, <laughs> hair is going to be found. On... They'll find Andy and they'll be like, well, all humans used to make model aeroplanes. <laughs> That's because they'll have found me in my tomb where I've been buried yeah. with all my air fixes. And all your rivet, pivots, yeah. rivets, the, rivets. Rivets. Homo riveting. <laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can all be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, Andy. At Spitfire, Spitfire, Spitfire. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> James <laughs> at James Harkin <laughs> and Ella uh, Ella underscore Al Shamahi yep or you can go to our group account which is at no such thing or you can go to our website no such thing as a fish dot com all of our previous episodes are up there so do check them out and uh, Ella does want to give another shout out quickly to Daniel Stone's book The Food Explorer uh, it is an amazing book so do try and track that down um, but otherwise come back next week because we'll be back with another episode and we'll see you then goodbye goodbye